The psychic type used to be considered the most powerful type back in the first generation, and since then we've been given both the steel type and the dark type to bump it down a notch. Our selection of psychic types in Shining Pearl is a mixed bag. I mean, on one hand we've got powerhouses like Alakazam and Gardevoir, but then of course we have Unknown. I'm pretty sure the reason it has that name is because the way to make that thing a viable team member is unknown. But today, I aim to find out if I can beat a Pokemon Shining Pearl Hardcore Nuzlocke using only psychic types. And if you're un familiar with the rule set of a hardcore Nuzlocke, they will be on screen right now, but for the time being, let's dive right into it. None of the Sinnoh starters actually evolve into a psychic type, so I go ahead and pick Chimchar, which will later give Barry the steel type Empoleon, and then I head back to Mom to get my ugly hat. Mom, 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 turn off the TV. It's time to hear about this video's sponsor. You've heard about it before. It's Raid Shadow Legends. That's right, I've been having an absolute blast playing Raid this past week. There are so many bosses in this game, but I think my favorite part of it, much like Pokemon, is the character themselves. I mean, just let me introduce you to these. Norog, the spikiest of hogs. Get in the holiday spirit with Sir Nicholas. I mean, just take one look at those antlers. Or my personal favorite, the hottest of champions, Magnar. And here I thought I was uncomfortable in my own skin. But speaking of bosses, this December, Raid is introducing their craziest boss yet, the Hydra. Go up against all six heads. The Head of Blight, kill it with fire before its poison withers you away. Seriously, this thing is more toxic than a wheezing on an all-kale diet. The Head of Torment, without a trusty Veil buff, it will find you, and it will kill you. The Head of Mischief will steal your buffs and share them with its other heads. Then there's the Head of Wrath, hitting it enough times will triple its deadly strikes in power. The Head of Decay will make your own healing hurt you, and finally, the Head of Suffering has a new debuff that makes you take damage when you hit it. If you thought Rough Skin Garchomp was bad, this is a whole new level of pain. On top of that, between now and January 28th, every player will get access to the limited edition champion, the eSports legend, and Navi champion Simple. Log in for 7 days before January 28th, and he's yours. So click the link in the description, or scan the QR code to join in on the action on PC or mobile, and get access to the Epic Hero 2. Tayrell, 200k silver, an experience boost, an energy refill, and an ancient shard, so that you can summon an awesome champion as soon as you get in the game. You'll find your rewards here in the inbox for the next 30 days only, so I hope to see you soon in Teleria. Okay, let's cut to the chase. I know some of you are wondering how this run is even possible in the first place. And since beating these two trainers awards you with the TM for workup instead of hidden power the way it used to be in Diamond and Pearl, a run with psychic types in this game isn't actually possible. The reason for this is of course that Abra only has the move Teleport, which doesn't actually do anything in trainer battles. And even though I actually managed to find an Abra and capture it in the very first ball before it teleported away, there aren't any other psychic types for us to catch before Rourke, which means that we're stuck with a level 4 Abra Abra that can't level up. I name it Jupiter, and it has a pretty good docile nature and the inner focus ability, which admittedly doesn't really do anything at all for us. I then have to make a pretty big decision. The level cap here is 14, but if I level up Abra to 16, it can actually evolve into a Kadabra. In doing so, we could actually beat Rourke since we'd have an attacking move in Confusion, but then we'd have to violate the sacred level cap, and honestly, the only other option is to skip Rourke altogether, and both options aren't really in the spirit of a Nuzlocke, so it doesn't really matter what we pick, but I ultimately decide to skip over work and add the additional rule where the run legitimately begins when a viable Pokemon has a damaging move. And as you can see, this is about as far as we could get without using this rule, so consider this the end of the run with the normal rule set. And so today we're gonna find out what would actually happen if it were possible for us to play a Pokemon Shining Pearl Hardcore Nuzlocke using only Psychic types. And I'll say that from here on out, it's looking pretty good, since as soon as we get to Flow Aroma Town, since I've played both Pokemon Sword and Shield and Let's Go Pikachu on my Switch, we get to choose between the two mythical Pokemon Jirachi and Mew, and as you can see, I obviously went with Mew because when else are we going to get to use this thing? My Mew, which I named Jupiter, has a plus special attack nature, which is going to be super amazing. But since we receive it at level 1, we are going to have to do some grinding, and with that, we managed to get Jupiter up to level 16, evolving it into a Kadabra. And with that, it's time to take on our first real challenge of this run, Commander Mars. And Commander Mars has a pretty formidable team for this part of the game. She starts out with a Zubat as we send in Pluto. And I decide to employ kind of an interesting strategy here. I use Reflect type to become a Poison and Flying type so that U-Turn does way less damage to me as she then switches out into Per Ugly. It uses Fake Out to flinch me right away, but then three Rock Smashes is enough to take this thing out. The Reflect type that I used at the beginning of the battle actually helped me out too, since the Per Ugly knows Thief, it's not actually super effective anymore. We can then take care of the Zubat with a Rock Tomb, and that's it for Commander Mars. 
which means we arrive in Eterna City where we can get a whole slew of new encounters, including a pure power metatite, a shingling in Mount Cornet, which is pretty much useless both until and when it evolves. And since we also get access to the Explorer Kit and thus the Grand Underground, I can find myself a Ralts. My friend said that Team Galactic took his favorite Pokemon away, but I don't think he's telling the truth. Team Galactic looks so cool. Oh yeah, don't think I'll ever be as cool as this guy. Before we take on the gym leader Gardenia, we do have to do a bit of grinding to the level cap, and in doing so, Ralts reached level 20, which means the Venus evolved into a Curlia. And so the time has come to face off against the second gym leader Gardenia and her grass types, and considering the fact that her ace grass type is also a poison type, this should be pretty doable. Now, Pluto doesn't actually have any good attacking moves at this point, but we do have access to both Workup and Baton Pass, which it got at level 20, which means that we can boost up to plus four special attack with Pluto and then pass it over to Jupiter to just outspeed with confusion against all of Gardenia's Pokemon, including Roserade, for an easy win. This means we claim our second gym badge and move to the Galactic Tower. Now you listen, our objectives are incredible. Uh, too incredible for me to understand, but, but incredible. Oh, so you're both cool and smart. What a deadly combination. Having witnessed Team Galactic's genius operation firsthand, it's time to fight their leader, Jupiter. And this fight starts pretty much exactly like the fight versus Mars. We use Reflect Type to mimic the typing of Zubat. It then locks us in the fight with a mean look, and since it can't really damage us too much with a Poison Fang, all I do is set up a few workups to make it a bit easier to take down the Skun Tank. After that, a few Rock Tombs is enough to take out both the Zubat and the Skun Tank, and I don't think I've ever dealt with Team Galactic that easily in my life. After all this, we get access to Wayward Cave, where I can capture myself a Bronzor, which had a rash nature much like all my Pokemon. I realized pretty quickly that this is because both Mew and Curlia have Synchronize. Pretty dang useful, since most of my Psychic types are special attackers. But at this point in our travels, we've reached Veilstone, city, and the thing about the new games is that you can buy some pretty insane TMs here. And not only can Mew learn every single TM in the game, but a lot of the great TMs like Thunderbolt can be learned by most of our Psychic types. Not to mention that we now have an infinite supply of the TM for, you know, Psychic. We also get access to a few new areas, in one of which we can catch one of my favorite Pokemon, Giraffereg. I also had to do a bit more grinding to the level cap in order to be able to use my strategy, which is gonna involve Venus, which now has evolved into a Gardevoir. If you know any ladies who like fishing, help me reel one in. Listen buddy, if you're asking a YouTuber for dating advice, all hope is already lost. And speaking of ladies who probably don't fish, but uh, who knows, next up we gotta go up against Maylene and her fighting types. And for this one, I came up with a pretty good strategy, involving a TM that I received right outside the gym, which happens to be Nasty Plot, which is pretty insane. Nasty Plot is a move that raises your special attack by two stages, so using it three times puts you at max special attack, which we can pass over to Gardevoir. On the switch, we get hit by a quad and effective Drain Punch, and we hit it back with a plus six Drain and Kiss for the KO. Then from a choke, I know I can get all my health back using Drain and Kiss, so I decide to go for Charm for a few turns just to burn out those last light screen turns. This means in the meantime, Machoke is going to be able to use all its moves that lower my speed, which isn't that big a deal since at base I'm slower than Lucario anyway. Then since we have full health when Lucario comes in, we can actually survive a non-crit Metal Claw. It does actually get the attack boost, but since we're at plus six, we take it out with a Psychic. And so that's going to be it for the third badge, and since we have our super powerful Gardevoir that didn't even level up to 31, we can use it against Wake and his water types, which was a pretty easy fight. All I had to do for this one is teach Gardevoir both Thunderbolt and Grass Knot for the first two Pokemon. We then get outsped and hit by an Ice Fang, which does massive damage, but a Thunderbolt is enough to take out the Floatzel as well, which I'm happy with since Wake was pretty difficult in both my other runs. Hey Psyduck, pull my finger. <laughs> Once again, appalled at my indecency, the Psyduck run off in disgust. And then as I make my way towards Celestic Town, I guess Neptune the Chingling decided it likes me enough to evolve into a Chimeco. And I mean, I just gotta find a way to effectively use this thing, it's too funny. But not only that, we get Mercury the Bronzor to a high enough level where it evolves into a Bronzong. And with all that goodness added to the team, it's time to face off against Miss Aubergine herself, Fantina and her ghost types. An instant Thunderbolt from Pluto is actually straight up enough to take out the Drift Limb. We then have to deal with Gengar, and knowing that this thing is gonna outspeed us and likely go for Confuse Ray, I equipped Pluto with a Person Berry, ridding it of its confusion and taking out the Gengar with one stab Psychic. And unfortunately, Psychic is our 
most powerful move against the incoming Miss Magius, but it got cursed bodied, so after getting confused here, we actually break through confusion and I go for the next best thing, a Thunderbolt. But seeing that it barely did any damage, I decide to swap out into Mercury as she goes for Phantom Force. And even though Miss Magius isn't famous for being a physical attacker, it almost does 50% to me as I then manage to put it to sleep with a Hypnosis. Since we now have a free sleep turn to swap into anything, I go into Venus, but unfortunately she wakes up first turn, which seems to always happen to me. I get hit by a Confused Ray again, but this time I don't have the Person Berry, but we break through and I go for a Psychic, which does a lot of damage, but unfortunately not quite enough to take it out, and the next turn we do hit ourselves in Confusion. This effectively puts me in a worse spot than I started in with Gardevoir. I hit myself in Confusion again as she vanishes, and I go ahead and swap out back into Pluto and get hit by a Phantom Force, which doesn't do too much. I then get hit by yet another Confuse Ray, but this time I very fortunately break through the Confusion and hit the Miss Magius for a bit over half. A couple turns later, I get hit by a Phantom Force down to just 21 HP, and I end up snapping out of Confusion, taking out the Miss Magius with a Psychic, giving us the fifth Gym Badge from Fantina. Then after once again kicking Barry's unremarkable butt, it's time Time to take on the 6th Gym Leader, Byron. But before we do so, I make sure to do a bit of training at Iron Island to get to the level cap and evolve my Meditite into a Metacham. Now, Byron is an interesting one. His Pokemon aren't super strong, but he does have two Pokemon with Sturdy, which can be pretty annoying to deal with. And so I came up with the super big brain strategy of Swords Dance Baton Pass, then Step on the Gas. The one annoying thing I will say is the Bronzor goes for Trick Room right away, it then set up Sandstorm and hit me with a Flash Cannon, and after that it goes for Confuse Ray, so I prepared for this by giving my Mew a Person Berry. And since it outsped me because of Trick Room, I go for Baton Pass after the fact, switching into Mars the Metacham safely. The Bronzor then outspeeds because of Trick Room and hits us with a Confuse Ray, which we're of course prepared for with that Person Berry in hand, and we can take it out with a Drain Punch. For the last two Pokemon, they're a little bit annoying, but since Drain Punch heals up HP, we can just pretty much freely spam it and any other move first to be able to take out the Sturdy ability, and then heal up to full health with a Drain Punch. Then I have to say I was pretty shaken up by having to sit through Professor Rowan's college stories. I'm feeling wobbly. Dude, what are you doing drinking at the library in the first place? Yeah, uh, drinking that many Capri Suns, which is what I was talking about the whole time, Susan. This part of the game just reminds me that I have several months of Swedish winter to go. I love how my girl has so much vivacity and charm. Yeah, all right. Way to show off with your big words, Mr. Vocabulary. I happen to know some, too. How about show off mother... Anyway, at this point in the game, it's time to take on Candace and her ice types. And in both the runs we've done in this game so far, this has been by far the most difficult gym fight. And I know that there's been a lot of Mew usage so far, but this time I went for a bit of a different strategy and started setting up Calm Minds with my Metacham. Much like in the last fight, it doesn't matter too much that we get hit by Avalanche from this thing, because we can just heal up to full by taking it out with a Drain Punch. Next up, we got Sneasel, which has a barrier to weaken our hit, but since it's both quad effective, stab, and we've got pure power, it's a clean knockout. Then we got the reason why we set up all those Calm Minds, we take out the Metacham with a Psychic, and finally, we can take out the Obama Snow with a final Drain Punch, and that is it for Candice. And I gotta say, it feels good to get through this fight without any casualties for once. Sheesh! But now that we've done that, it's time to take care of the bowl cut freaks once and for all. I'm a Team Galactic member, but I don't even have a Pokemon. I'm the gruntiest of grunts. Yeah, buddy, but don't let that get you down, because you're so cool and really smart, remember? I cooperated with Team Galactic, but this experiment has gone too far. I can't say anything in our defense. But that thing we made, what is it going to be used? For. Wait, what exactly did- Oh my goodness, I knew Team Galactic had to be stopped! And so to be able to complete my plans to take out this evil organization, I contacted my friend Andrew to be able to trade Kadabra and evolve it into the ultimate Alakazam. I also realized that now that I have the 7th Gym Badge, I can find myself a wild Mr. Mime, which I capture and name Uranus. And with all the planets starting to align, it's time to take on the big bad boss of Pineapple on Pizza himself, Cyrus. He starts out with his Honchkrow as I go for Venus, and the very first turn, I get a lucky Quick Claw proc and take it out in one hit with a Dazzling Gleam. And that thing can be hugely problematic critting through your entire team, but next up is Crobat, so I decide to swap out into my Bronzong. On the switch, the Crobat goes for Tailwind, so we could have easily just taken it out with a Psychic, but next it hits us with a U-turn as we go for a Hypnosis on the switch, 
switch, putting the Gyarados to sleep. This ends up being immensely important since Gyarados is a huge threat to our team with Crunch. Making use of the sleep, I decide to swap out into Uranus to try and go for the Thunderbolt, but of course the Gyarados has a berry to weaken the damage, and so the Gyarados only takes about a third of damage, but the Tailwind then peters out and we're actually faster than the Gyarados with Mr. Mime and take it out with another Thunderbolt. This means that Crobat is up next, and I just think it's kind of funny that Quick Clock can proc before you switch, but we go ahead and swap back into Bronzong as it goes for a Tailwind once again. Then we pretty much go through the exact same turn of events as it U-turns out into Weavile and we put it to sleep with another Hypnosis. This means that we're free to swap out into Mars, and since this Weavile doesn't actually have a dark move, we're incredibly safe here. And much like with Candace's Sneasel, this thing has paper-thin defenses, so even though it has a berry to resist our damage, we can take it out with a single Drain Punch. Finally, Cyrus's last Pokemon is a Crobat, which hits us with an Air Cutter, which does about 45% non-crit. This means that even though we can take it out with another Psychic, I decide to swap out to not risk being taken out by a crit, but immediately as I switch out into Bronzong, I realize that I don't actually have any attacking moves on this thing for whatever reason, so I put it to sleep with a Hypnosis and then decide to swap out into Alakazam. And the next turn, we get lucky, it doesn't get the Quick Claw proc, and we can outspeed and just finish it off with a Psychic, and that's gonna be it for Cyrus and the rest of Team Galactic. Yo guys, I hate that I have to be the one to make this observation, but Palkia looks like a dick. Um, anyway. Oh, hello, you're quite the nifty trainer. My husband's a sailor, and he's off working somewhere far away. All oh, that waiting every day gets very boring, though. Listen, lady, you stay away from my Palkia! Now that we've arrived in Sunny Shore City, it's time to take on the 8th Gym versus Volkner and his Electric types. And I made a decision that from here on out, since we don't have any deaths in this run, we're gonna have to risk it to get the Biscuit. You'll see what I mean. The very first turn, we get hit by a Volt Switch from Raichu, so I decide to go for a Psychic against the Ambipom, which leaves it in the red, so Volkner goes for a Full Restore, which gives me a perfect opportunity to set up a Sword Stance. The next turn, Ambipom does massive damage with a double hit as we Baton pass out into one of my favorite Pokemon of all time, Giraffe Rig. Our beloved Giraffe then actually managed to dodge a double hit as we go for an agility, and the next turn we can outspeed and almost take out the Ambipom with an Earthquake. A weak non-stab Thunderbolt does barely any damage as we then take it out with a second Earthquake. Next up it's Raichu, which gets absolutely obliterated even through that berry. And it seems we don't have the power to actually take out Octillery, but it goes for focus energy, so we're just free to take it out the next turn. After that, we just outspeed the Luxray, and I don't know about you guys, but I've never seen a Giraffe Rig sweep in any Nuzlocke ever, so this one's for the history books, guys. It's also gotta be said that anytime you defeat a swimmer, they commit some kind of weird swimmer seppuku with their goggles. It's pretty funny. Then as I was going through Victory Road, the final gauntlet before the Elite Four, I actually run into a shiny Machoke, which is a dang shame since we're not going to be able to use it at all this run. But speaking of the Elite Four, we've managed to get here deathless, and I intend to try and keep it that way as we take on the first member, Eren and his bug types. Naturally, I start out with Pluto here, and I decided to give Pluto more of a supportive role during the Elite Four, kind of the way it's been the whole playthrough. And as you can see in this super sped up footage of me trying to get as many boosts as possible as we waste light screen turns, I'm actually trying to get poisoned on Mew here. I know I had the Petcha Berry to heal it off, but that's just to make Dustox waste two turns going for Toxic. This means that as soon as we actually have as many boosts as we want, we can go for Baton Pass with a 0% chance that this Dustox is going to poison us on the switch into Alakazam. Unfortunately, my turn count here was one turn wrong, so it does go for Light Screen as we take it out with a Psychic. And I thought this might be an issue, but we actually managed to take out the Beautifly, the Vespaquen, and the Heracross in one hit despite this. I thought the Drapion might live, but it turns out the plus six Alakazam with Wise Glasses does the trick even through Light Screen. Which means that we can move on to the second of the Elite Four members, Bertha and her ground types, leading with Quagsire as we once again start out with Pluto. And much like Dustox, Bertha's Quagsire also has Toxic, so I decide to go for an Amnesia right away so that it's more likely to go for Earthquake instead of Surf against us for more damage. Now this time, we're also setting up to plus six with Nasty Plot, and I didn't put a Petcha Berry on Mew this time because we really want to get Toxic so that we don't get poisoned on the switch out into Chimeco. This is also why we want it to go for Earthquake here, because we pretty much just get a free switch in against Earthquake on Levitate. And that's right, I managed to do it. I managed to sweep through an entire Elite Four members team using only a Chimeco. And despite the fact that Chimeco flawlessly destroyed Bertha, it's actually going to be a super clutch team member for the rest of the Elite Four. I know, you don't have to check your ears, you actually heard right, Chimeco's about to put in some work. But before we can get to any 
of that, we have to face off against the fiery clown himself, Flint. Despite the fact that Flint calls himself a fire trainer and thus lives in clown world, he actually does outspeed Pluto here and puts it to sleep, but I do have the Chesto Berry to wake us up and go for a surf, which actually manages to take it out because of a lucky crit. Flint's next fire type is Steelix, and we can just take this thing out with a single surf, no problem. Next up is Lopunny, and expecting this thing to go for Mirror Coat, I decide to set up a few nasty plots. It ends up hitting me with a few fire punches, but since Lopunny isn't very strong and I've got goaded defenses, I can just wait it out and take it out with a single surf at plus six. Then we've got Drift Blim, and it's at this point I decide a baton pass out into Venus. The Drift Blim then misses its inconsequential Will-O-Wisp as we destroy it with a Thunderbolt. This means we only have to deal with Flint's final Pokemon, an actual fire type, Infernape. After getting hit hard by a fire punch, I put it to sleep with Hypnosis, and the next turn it of course stays asleep and I take it down to his focus sack with Psychic. And the way we're going to win here is a lot of cheese. The AI has already used up its Focus Sash, and it's going to go for a full restore, which means that we can just one-hit KO it with another Psychic. And with that, we've defeated the third of the four elites, which means that we're left with only Lucian and his Psychic types. But I'm feeling pretty confident about the Psychic type mirror match. As Lucian starts out with Mr. Mime, I send out Pluto, and this time, we're going to let Mercury do some work. Knowing that he's going to go for a light screen, I decide to set up a substitute so that he can't easily damage us. I then start setting up amnesias to make it even less likely that he's going to break our subs. But not only do I decide to get to plus six special defense, I also decide to set up with swords dance to plus six attack. After that, it's time to pass off our boosts to our hero, Mercury. But not only that, since Mr. Mime hasn't broken our sub, we still have that extra layer of protection as we swap out. I then, however, remember that I didn't use any PP ups or anything like that on my gyro ball, so I only have five to use, and we burned two taking out Mr. Mime. However, good fortune strikes as Medicham misses its high jump kick, taking out half of its health as we go for an iron defense. The next turn, it actually does a fair amount of damage with high jump kick as we go for hypnosis to try and put it to sleep. After that, I try to take it out with a psychic, but it leaves it at about 20%. Lucian then, for whatever reason, swaps out the Metacham for Alakazam as I go for another Psychic, which does minimal damage. He then gets a crit Shockwave on us, which does a huge amount of damage as I hit it for a Gyro Ball, taking out the Alakazam in one hit. Now, I didn't know Sleep Turns didn't reset in this game, but it wakes up and actually leaves Mercury on one HP as I take it out with an incoming Gyro Ball. Finally, we only have Giraffe Rig to deal with, but since we burned all five of my Gyro Balls, I have to swap out into Metacham and just take it out with a couple of drain punches. I guess he actually does have a Bronzong as well, which I totally forgot about, but we take it out with a couple of drain punches, and that's it for the Elite Four. And this means that the only fight that remains is the one that matters most, the champion fight versus Cynthia. And this fight is notoriously tricky in this game. Cynthia has some awesome items and some very good EV trained Pokemon. But I wasn't going to let up. I was going to try to beat this champion fight without any deaths. And what I needed to do is set up plus six with Amnesia so that the Spiritomb can't hurt me. The funny thing is that since I boosted my special defense with Amnesia, Spiritomb starts to go for Sucker Punch to try and hit me on the physical side, but it can't since I'm not using damaging moves. This means I can stall out four of the Sucker Punch turns with setup and then go for Baton pass to get a free switch into Gardevoir with all those boosts. I do end up missing my first Hypnosis, which means I get hit by a Dark Pulse, but the reason we want to put it to sleep here is because I couldn't use three Nasty Plots to get to plus six special attack. This then allows us to go for a Calm Mind, and now that I'm at plus five, I feel confident, so I destroy the Spear Tomb with a Thunderbolt. The Roserade then misses a super effective Sludge Bomb, which we could have easily tanked with our Amnesia boost, but we then take it and Gastrodon out with Psychics. Now, Cynthia's Lucario is really strong, but since it can't see the K because of all our special defense boosts, I decided to just click Psychic since it's probably going to go for Nasty Plot, and that's exactly what happens. I then take out the Milotic with a Thunderbolt, which only leaves the big bad himself, Garchomp. And this is unfortunately where we encounter the first death of the run as it outspeeds and takes us out with Poison Jab. So we don't have any boosts anymore, but we do have Chimeco, and as the Garchomp sets up with Swords Dance, I go for a Yawn so that it goes to sleep after Chimeco unfortunately has to go down. 
However, because of the little bell that could, the Garchomp falls asleep and we can take it out with a Psychic. Yeah, we do get a crit, but we don't actually take it out. And Cynthia then goes for a full restore, which is very scary. The next turn, we go for a Psychic, which does about 60%, and we then avoid an Earthquake with the Power of Love, one of the like three times that happened this run. And so, ladies and gentlemen, that's how I did it. That's how I beat a Pokemon Shining Pearl Hardcore Nuzlocke using only Baton pa I mean, uh, Psychic types. And I gotta say, it was a blast to use Mew through this entire run, but it's a pretty overpowered Pokemon, and I'm sure it would have been possible without it, but when else are we gonna get the chance? Now that we've played through Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl so many times, I'm itching to get into some other Pokemon games, and you guys have been giving great suggestions down in the comments below, so I got a good one for you next time. But remember, if there's a specific type and game combination you would like me to see, leave it down in the comments below, and while you're down there, you might as well leave a like, and if you're not subscribed yet, what are you doing? And so, ladies and gentlemen, until we see each other next time, have a good one.